participants are joining, so we will begin in a moment. Participants are still joining, so we are here. We will begin in a moment. All right, participants have stopped joining, so we will begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Reunion. Welcome back to Union. A few housekeeping items before we start. There is a Q&A feature and there is a chat feature. So if you have issues or if you want to be emphatic and welcome everyone and share praise, you can use the chat feature, especially also if you have technical issues, please put your question in the chat if you can. At the end of the session, if you have questions about the topic, please do use the Q&A feature at the bottom. We will ask you to do a very short survey at the end. And before we begin, before I introduce our guest of honor, there is a short video that we would like to show you now, and then we will introduce our faculty member. Hey, what's up, Union alum? Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to Union. Welcome to Reunion 2021. We're so glad you could join us for this year's virtual reunion. Where we've come together to reunite with our community safely. Reflect on a year of global challenge. And rejoice in our faith and our mission of service to the church, academy, and society. Now, more than ever, our community is called to truly change the world. By bringing a religiously grounded, critical, and yet compassionate presence to the major personal, social, political, and scientific realities of our time. We hope the reunion programming planned for this week will leave you feeling enriched. And also reconnected to Union. We celebrate your return and we appreciate you for your bountiful support. Through your prayers, through your giving, and through your ongoing devotion. As my Danish family says, mangitak, which is simply thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I can't wait to see you and enjoy the week. And now I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest of honor, Dr. John Tatominal. On our faculty here at Union, Dr. Tatominal teaches a wide variety of courses in the areas of comparative theology, religious diversity, Hindu-Christian dialogue, the theology of Paul Tillich, theory of religion, and process theology. Dr. T, as we call him, is committed to the work of comparative theology, theology that learns from and with a variety of traditions. A central question driving his work is how can Christian communities come to see religious diversity as a promise rather than a problem? He is passionate but an irregular practitioner of Vipassana meditation and includes time for meditation in virtually all of his courses at Union. Dr. Tatamino is here to talk about his book, Circling the Elephant. And now I turn it over to you, Dr. T. Thank you, Nicole, and for the folks in development for making this possible. Um, webinars have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. And the disadvantage is that I can't see any of you. And when you're uh, an extrovert like me, it's, it's really strange uh, to be talking to a group that you cannot see. Um, but welcome. I, I see some familiar names, and I'm, I'm glad you're with us. So I just want to say a bit about the book as a whole, and then focus on one chapter to give you a really substantial and meaty introduction to the kind of work I do in the book. 
uh, and I hope that will be uh, okay for you. So the book begins with, and is grounded around this central allegory of circling the elephant. And uh, as I suspect many of you know, that allegory is ancient and is traceable to Buddhist and Jain texts. And uh, you know how this goes. I suspect most of you know the allegory. Um, a, a king gathers around um, an elephant a number of blind persons. And uh, each of the blind persons ventures a guess as to what it is that they're encountering. And pretty soon they begin to argue. Uh, as one says, this is plainly a wall by feeling up against the side of the elephant. And somebody else grabs the leg and says, this is clearly a tree trunk. And somebody else grabs the leg and says, you fools, how could you be so wrong? It's clearly a rope. And somebody uh, grabs a hold of the, the, the tusk and says, you're all idiots. It's clearly a spear. Uh, and so the argument goes um, until, according to various tellings of the story, either a, a sighted person comes along or the king who uh, gathered this group uh, fills the, the, the blind persons in on what it is that they're actually, uh, what they're actually seeing or sorry, rather feeling. Now, in the book, I show that this is a, a problematic image in many ways, including from a disability theology standpoint. I quote the work of uh, a blind theologian named John Hull, who, who tells us that in fact, no actual blind person would make this mistake. Uh, that because blind persons don't have the illusion of taking in everything at once, the way sighted people do, that, that blind persons actually don't make guesses about things so quickly. So he, he told those of us who want to use this analogy or allegory that we should uh, henceforth speak of it as uh, the elephant surrounded by either blindfolded persons or sighted persons in a darkened room because no actual blind person would make uh, these errors. So uh, I, I do that bit of work very quickly. The point, the, the really interesting thing about the allegory is that it allows us to think about religious diversity. Why are there so many different accounts of ultimate reality? And is there a way of imagining that the differences really do matter and that the differences might be complementary rather than contradictory, even if at first, it seems that there is no possible hope for reconciliation between these various perspectives. So that's the reason the allegory uh, has been such a fruitful one over the many uh, centuries that it's been deployed in India. But in, in the last 30 to 40 years, it's fallen out of favor in Christian uh, theology in particular because critics have said, well, you know, there is no sighted person that can take in the whole elephant. So this is a condescending allegory because it assumes that someone somewhere knows what the elephant is. And my response has been in this book, as you can see, that no, in fact, no one knows uh, whether we're all standing in front of an elephant or, or some of us in front of an elephant and somebody else in front of a donkey. But it's a useful hypothesis for thinking about religious diversity. It's a useful hypothesis and in many ways much to be preferred to the standard allegories used in this literature. The standard allegories are, you know, the various religions are paths up the same mountain. That's, that's, that's the big one. Uh, sometimes there's also the allegory uh, or the analogy of planets orbiting around the same sun. 
Both of those analogies uh, slash allegories are, I think, profoundly limited um, for reasons that perhaps we can talk about in uh, Q&A. Uh, that said, the reason why I use the central image is not exactly to deploy it for the same reason that it has always been deployed. Namely, I want to do something else with it. I want to use the elephant allegory as a way of thinking about three theological projects as interlinked. The first theological project is what is often called theology of religions or theology of religious diversity. And that's the subfield within theology that asks, why are there so many different accounts of the elephant? Right? Are, is religious diversity a mistake? Is it a positive good? How are we to understand the diversity of religious accounts? That's theology of religious diversity. So in terms of the allegory, why do we have so many accounts of this elephant? That's one of the fields in which I work. The second one, the one in which uh, I do much, if not most of my work is comparative theology. Comparative theology is actually walking over to another side of the elephant. Insofar as possible, one moves uh, by means of learning. Sometimes that's scriptural learning, reading other texts, studying Sanskrit, working, but, but, but more, I, I say that you can't really move to another side of the elephant without at least engaging some of the practices of another tradition. So that's comparative theology. And then the third project is constructive theology, the work of trying to re-describe the elephant in light of the other two tasks, right? So that's how I'm using the, the elephant imagery in this book. I'm arguing that all three of those tasks must be integrated. And then I do some work to ask, why haven't we always been doing this and deconstructing old ways of doing these things and proposing uh, a creative way of combining all three of those, um, all three of those projects. So the book actually makes contributions to constructive theology comparative theology, theology of religious diversity, and also theory of religion. Uh, I don't know how I finished it. It's exhausting even to describe all the things that are, <laughs> that are in the book. Now, at the heart of the book is the idea of interreligious learning, that it, it is urgent upon Christians to learn from traditions other than the Christian tradition. And in order to do that, I call for the hospitality of receiving, the hospitality of receiving. And I'll, that chapter, uh, that concept is articulated in my chapter on Gandhi King and interreligious learning. So I'll just say a couple of words about that chapter to give you a feel for what it is that I'm trying to do. And, uh, Part of what that chapter is trying to accomplish is to say, not only is interreligious learning possible, it's already happened. <laughs> it's one thing to say, we should learn from other religious traditions, such learning is possible. Well, one way to say that it's possible is to show it's already happened, which is a kind of proof of the argument. So my argument in the Gandhi King chapter is to say, look at the world transforming consequences of interreligious learning. Look at how Gandhi learned from other religious traditions. He was a keen student of, 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 of a variety of traditions, uh, a, a dedicated practitioner of Hinduism, a deep reader of the Bhagavad Gita, but also through Tolstoy, he was an, uh, a careful reader of the Sermon on the Mount. He was deeply influenced by Tolstoy's book, The Kingdom of God is Within You. And Tolstoy was influenced by a variety of American 
uh, pacifists and abolitionists. So ideas from America, abolitionism and Quakerism and, uh, and a reading of the Sermon on the Mount that doesn't allegorize the Sermon on the Mount away are received into Tolstoy's work. And then Tolstoy is read by Gandhi and, and Gandhi transforms what he receives from Tolstoy in a Hindu key. And all of that is bequeathed back to the US through the encounter between King's teachers and, uh, and then of course, those teachers mediate all of the learning, interreligious learning too, uh, to King. And then of course, King also travels to, uh, to India and uh, meets with many of the living Gandhians uh, and, and Gandhi's foremost disciples. So there's a complicated work of interreligious learning. And just to give you a sense of what, what enabled this um, receiving in Gandhi and King, just want to give you little snippets. I'd rather talk to you than, than, than uh, lecture at a blank screen. So I'll, I'll try to keep this part um, relatively brief. But I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see um, snippets of how Gandhi and King are thinking about the hospitality of receiving. The phrase is mine, but uh, the idea is not. So the phrase that I've been using here is the hospitality of receiving. I think it's chapter six from my book. Uh, let's see. Here's Gandhi. One of the things that we don't, um, unless you're a Gandhi scholar, and even Gandhi scholars don't quite know this well, is that Gandhi gave a lot of talks to Christian missionaries. Christian missionaries were fascinated by this man who plainly loved Jesus and the Christian tradition, but would never undergo any kind of conversion. So because of that, and because of a clear sense that he was in some way deeply shaped by the Christian tradition, Missionaries found him an object of perpetual fascination. And contemporary Christians do too, you know. Uh, so in one of these talks, Gandhi says this, you missionaries come to India thinking that you come to a land of heathens or uh, of idolaters, of men who do not know God. I place these facts before you in all humility for the simple reason that you may know this land better. You are here to find out the distress of the people of India and remove it. But I hope you are here also in a receptive mood. And if there's anything that India has to give, you will not stop your ears, you will not close your eyes and steal your hearts, but open up your ears, eyes, and most of all your hearts to receive all that may be good in this land. I give you my assurance that there is a great deal of good in India. You know, I don't know about you, but I find that painful reading, particularly that last, that last sentence. Imagine Gandhi having to tell missionaries that there is a great deal of good in India. What's Gandhi saying here? What's the intention of, of, of this statement? Well, here's how I put it. I think Gandhi is trying to tell the missionary is something like this. You cannot give without taking, without receiving. Gandhi, I believe, speaks a fundamental human truth. The one who seeks to give without receiving does neither. Authentic giving requires receptivity. Those who seek to give must stand prepared to receive as any giving that comes from on high from an attitude of asymmetrical condescension demeans and does not enrich. If you give in such a way that suggests you have nothing to receive, then you do not in truth give, instead you violate. That's a core claim in my book. And I think I, I've learned this from reading Gandhi's uh, 
speeches to missionaries. He is saying just this. You come to my country, you come to our country, and well-intentioned, you seek to give us things, but I miss receptivity, he says. I miss a, a, a sense of open-heartedness. And in so uh, in, not, in failing to display that, you actually wound. You actually wound. So that's the basis of uh, my, the notion of the hospitality of receiving. I also have learned from a, a wonderful Pentecostal theologian named Amos Young. And Amos Young reminds us that Jesus was an exemplary recipient of hospitality. We think of him as constantly healing and giving to others. But in truth, as the son of man has no place to lay his head, to quote that verse from the Bible, he's constantly dependent upon uh, the graciousness of others. Um, he, he is fed and hosted by all manner of people, unsavory people, uh, according to the, the norms of the day. Um, and perhaps part of the reason Jesus is perceived as scandalous is that he opens himself up to receive from tax collectors and others of, uh, of low estate, uh, in the terms of the day. So he himself is a, 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 gives to others the dignity of letting them uh, care for him. And yet we who claim to be his disciples fail to do likewise. So combining ideas from Yong and uh, from, from Gandhi, I say we need to practice a hospitality of receiving. And, and Gandhi himself did this. He himself talked about <clears throat> the way in which all our traditions are imperfect, always on the way towards truth, which is God. And that as we are imperfect and, and partial seekers after truth, we need the witness of each of our traditions. So we have not realized religion in its perfection, even as we have not realized God. Religion of our conception being thus imperfect is always subject to a process of evolution and reinterpretation. Progress towards truth is possible only because of such evolution. And if there is possibility of progress, then he argues looking at all religions with equal eye we would not only hesitate, but would think it our duty to blend into our faith every acceptable feature of other faiths. So note here, he's not just uh, making a kind of let's all hold hands. No, if all our traditions are imperfect, there's room for mutual critique and room for mutual learning. They're not just different paths up the same mountain and so it's just really irrelevant what they're doing on the other side of the mountain. Our obligation is to just keep going up our side. No, because ours is imperfect and incomplete, we can learn. So that's Gandhi's reasons uh, for a hospitality of receiving. And, and Martin Luther King does a great deal of receiving as well. My apologies for that. My phone is ringing. You probably can hear it. Let me see. Oh, sorry about this, friends. It's... There we go. So uh, I just want to just give you a feeling and then I'll stop. After he has made his trip to India, Gandhi, uh, sorry, King and Coretta Scott uh, King go to the Holy Land uh, as a stopover. Then he comes back after several weeks away from Montgomery Baptist Church and he ascends the pulpit on Palm Sunday, on Palm Sunday, and asks his congregation leave to not preach about Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He says, you know, I was just there and I saw the remains of the gate 
from the Mount of Olives. So if I wanted to, I could speak in personal terms about Jesus' triumphant entry. But I want to speak instead about Mahatma Gandhi. And then he appeals to two passages of scripture as his texts for the day. One passage, there are other sheep that are not of this fold. The second passage, also from John, you will do greater things than these. And King says that Gandhi has done greater things than Jesus. Because after all, in Jesus' life, he could only affect a handful of people. But Gandhi took the ideas of Jesus and did greater things than Jesus did in his lifetime. Talk about a daring instance of interreligious hospitality in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, in a Baptist church. It's just a brilliant moment in the history of interreligious giving and receiving. He was severely crit criti uh, critiqued by some of the leading Christian thinkers of the day who questioned his Christianity because of his ardent fondness for Gandhi. And no less a figure than Howard Fay, then the editor of Christian Century, questioned King's faith because of his openness to Gandhi. But he maintained his fidelity and he argued that Gandhi was probably the first person in, the history, in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. So he made a case that it is from Gandhi that we learn to see Jesus as Satyagrahi, the ideal practitioner of nonviolent resistance, not just as an individual turn the cheek philosophy, but as a collective program for nonviolent resistance. I argue in that chapter that in effect, Gandhi is giving us a new Christology that King receives. And King confesses that he still believes that in Jesus Christ, Christians have the fullness of uh, divine disclosure. But even if that's so, he says, we can still learn. And I'll stop by reading this quote to show you how he's able to maintain a kind of traditional Christian commitment, even as he says, but we can still learn. So as my Christology goes, I believe as firmly now as ever that God revealed himself, right? One's commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, however, should not mean that one cannot be inspired by another great personality. While I firmly believe that God reveals himself more completely and uniquely in Christianity than other religion, mind you, uh, this is 1962, that in which he is saying we might want to say more today, but this is remarkable. I cannot make myself believe that God did not reveal himself in other religions. I believe that in some marvelous way, God worked through Gandhi and the spirit of Jesus saturated his life. And then again, he refers to the gospel of John. You see this, right? You see how he says, I can be a traditional Christian, dear Harold, don't question me, <laughs> but I can still open-heartedly engage in the hospitality of receiving and learn wisdom from other traditions. And then he has other things to say on this, this vein, but I'll stop there. Uh, that's almost exactly 25 minutes. And then let's uh, feel some questions and talk some more. So questions. Yes, thank you. That was wonderful. Please use the Q&A feature. We'd love to have Dr. T answer some questions. And I can start with one. And this may be outside of union, of course, but learning about other cultures and traditions feels like a rarity these days. Again, perhaps not outside of union, but does today's divisiveness and crystallization of perspective, was that, a, was that an inspiration for you as you wrote this book? Certainly. Uh... I talk a lot in this book about porosity uh, and 
explicitly in order to contest the idea that our traditions have walls around them. Yeah. And, and there are theological traditions uh, in Christian theology that suggest that, our, that the various religions are very tightly boundaried uh, and that it makes no sense to combine ingredients from different traditions, as Gandhi said we should, because that would make as much sense as combining elements from chess and soccer. I mean, they're both games, but right, nonsense would result if you combined elements of, of chess and soccer. So there are theological and philosophical arguments that suggest that our traditions are cons cons constituted by rules, um, like the rules of a game or the rules of grammar that make it impossible and nonsensical to learn from other religious traditions. I think of those kinds of theological arguments as the theological equivalent of tr Trumpian walls, you know, build that wall, right? That, that, that kind of rhetoric. Uh, so I, I think theologians should not aid and abet that kind of theological project. And if you can show to people that remarkable figures like Gandhi and King really did learn from other religious traditions and in the process of learning made civilizational transformation possible, right? I mean, the reception and practice of nonviolent resistance in the South was, was fundamentally a, 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 an instance of interreligious learning. So look what happens to us when we actually do commit ourselves to such learning. Look what happens to our communities, our societies, our nations. So yes, exactly. I, your, your, your question is directly on point in terms of why I wanted to, to write such a book and make such a case. Um, this is Kevin here. It's like I'm coming from behind the veil with, with Navaz. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Chitaminal, Dr. Chitaminal, thank you so much for that. That was really an amazing talk. So I, I have like kind of two questions and um, indulge me with the second one because I, I love long form interviews and love hearing about authors sort of like writing process. But the first one is, so where do we go next kind of in you know this moment i feel like after the with the trump you know presidency and so much is kind of talked about the evangelical like you know right but also just christianity and religion and i heard so many people and even now president jones say that like after even though now we elected you know president biden there's still so much work to do in our own religious communities, especially with people that, that might have gone. And this is, might be a little bit um, outside of, of your wheelhouse, but I was really like influenced by thinking about this interreligious and sort of the aspect of your book. It's like we can learn so much from our neighbors. And so where do we start? Like, how can we actually do that? And I feel that a lot of our alums might be thinking the same things when they're, especially our union alums might be thinking the same things when they go to their own communities or congregations. Thank you for that urgent, practical question. I think we're in a period of extended repair. Um, many of us knew this. I suspect many on this, on this call um, knew what would happen when Trump was elected. And I said as much in, in public writing that this would tear uh, the fabric of the nation by giving warrant and permission for, um, for an aggressive strain of hate that's always been part of the US, um, the US body politic to come out of the closet. In effect, the KKK without any need for masks, you know? And that's, that's what happened. I, I said as much, and, and now we have to hope and pray that we can do the work of, of repair, 
and that work of repair will always seem slower than the work of destruction. That's, that's a tragic irony. I often think about how uh, a, a, a kid on a beach might take meticulous care to build a sandcastle, but some bully walks by and it takes a millisecond for him to kick it over. Destruction has a kind of power to it because it can be so easily done. Creativity takes labor, love, and patience. And that makes people think that creativity is somehow weaker or less powerful, but it isn't. No sandcastle built, no one to kick anything over, right? So creativity is prior to, deeper than, more powerful than the powers of the de de destruction. So, but they are labor intensive. They mean re-winning trust. They mean face-to-face -face conversation. I think it primarily means local action at community levels for clergy to partner with the, the local uh, masjid, the, the local synagogue, and, and to bring people together to act together to repair and win trust back again. Uh, that's local on the ground, nitty gritty face-to-face -face work. And that's precious, slow, urgent work. And it's the calling of the moment. Yeah, definitely. I really appreciate that. We actually have a question from um, John Cole. Um, so John, I am going to um, allow you to talk and ask your question directly to Dr. John Mill. Uh, please. So I don't know whether I'm, am I? Am yes, I, John, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, I guess my question is that uh, at, at, at age 80, having completed 41 years of ministry in the Methodist Church, retired about nine years ago, and have increasingly come to the conclusion that uh, the, what, what we need more of in the congregations that I served and in my denomination is something that I get from Richard Rora and from the movement out there and his, his meditation center in Arizona, which is a return to a kind of mysticism where you have an inner sense of, of a unity of the holy in, in, in your life. And, and the, the, the thing that, that I find uh, he continually talks about and I agree with is that, that we are so dualistic in Western thinking and tend to separate things out. And I, the church has been guilty of a huge amount of this. Uh, this is good, this is bad, this is heaven, this is hell, this is, you know, dark, this is light. And, and we tend to not see the other side of God's creation as being one. And, um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I like, I've, I've begun to read your elephant book and will continue uh, gradually getting into it over the summer, I hope. But, um, you know, this is pointing us towards a more non-dualistic way of doing our practical religion in congregations where we either are members or serve. I'll stop and, and just end right there. John, that's uh, remarkably uh, far-sighted. I think. I, I, my first book was an argument for Christian non-dualism. <laughs> so. Uh, I was writing about these matters quite some time ago, but I'm happy to have help from Father Rohr because he, obviously he, he has a broader uh, audience than I do. Um, and he writes more accessibly and you know, he's, he's not trying in the first instance to make the scholarly argument. But I do think you're right. I, I, I think if there isn't a kind of spiritual labor a kind of working on ourselves, right? Then, then the, even this lovely notion of a hospitality of receiving, uh, how, do, how do we actually get people 
in into that posture of receptivity. I think your intuition that opening up people into a kind of mystical death um, in, in their own life would, would be part of the spiritual work needed to create the conditions for learning from uh, other religious traditions. And I'm delighted to see that Rohr is getting the kind of uptake on his arguments. I think there really is something happening, a real desire for a, a, a non-dual Christianity that is uh, emerging across the country. And, and I love that. Thank you. We have another question, uh, Dr. T, uh, from Robert Ray. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Have we decided what Jesus said and what Christianity actually is? Uh, among the things I try to do in, in this in this book, there's a reason that it's as long as it is. Uh, it's not a Gary Dorian 600 pager, but you know it's it's a close to 300. And one of the things I I do make uh, some effort to say is that there is no single Christianity. There is no single Buddhism. So when we talk in ways that suggest that there's some homogenous Christianity out there and some homogenous Buddhism out there. Usually when people are doing that, it's because they want to privilege their reading of Christianity. I, that's what they want to do. So I think it's essential to talk about Christianities, Buddhisms, in order to de-reify our traditions. Because if they're tightly united and, and walled up, then how do you break up that entity in order to receive anything from another tradition? You have to say, oh, you know, our traditions have never been uh, this highly integrated cultural linguistic game. Our tradition has always received wisdom from other traditions. Right? So in, in the last chapter of my book, I point out how Gregory of Nyssa, one of the key figures in the formulation of Christian Trinitarianism. You know how he made his argument? He said, well, you know, the pagans are right about the manliness of divinity, but they're wrong that there's no unity in it. The Jews, on the other hand, are right about the unity of God, but they admit of no diversity in divinity. We Christians, <laughs> of course, right? We Christians are the ones who are right in the middle insofar as we accept wisdom from both. Right? The pagans are right about, the, about manyness, the Jews are right about oneness. We say oneness in diversity, in Trinity. You see, he was explicitly formulating the key, a key maybe, the, I'll leave that to you, uh, the framework of Christian Trinitarianism in dialogue with other religious traditions. That's how one of the founding figures of our tradition did theology. In some ways, I'm saying, let's go back to doing theology that way, that way of open-hearted receiving and learning. And when Christianities do that, they can't be a homogenous single thing. So I hope that's a start, starter answer to Robert's really good question. Thank you for that. Um, so we have another question from Nancy Jennings, where she says, I think it was Toynbee who said, there's nothing smaller than a mind that is all made up. How can we begin to open minds to receiving the gifts of other faiths? I'm uh, a bit distracted by uh, uh, John Webster's really great point <laughs> at the point. This is the trouble with, you know, like webinar. You, you don't just see the question that's in front of you. You see the question that's two ways, you know, two questions down. So uh, yeah, I, how to begin this work? My intuition is that much of this work can be done through the cultivation of interreligious friendships. 
it it requires something like intimacy uh, in order to be curious about and intrigued enough to say, you know, what makes my neighbor tick? This one's dear to me. Uh, so why does he see things as he does? That, it seems to me, is to be one of the key steps, right? Like most of us now, particularly in major metropolitan areas, have coworkers, friends from other religious traditions. But we have somehow come to believe that we can love our neighbor while dismissing everything they take to be essential or sacred. How is that possible? How can I love my neighbor, a biblical injunction, if I know nothing about what the neighbor cherishes? And if I maintain a posture that suggests that the neighbor has nothing to teach me, right? But, but I might have something to teach them, right? So I, I think very relationally in terms of how to make this work happen. Without intimacy, without learning face-to-face, -face, uh, not, not much is gonna happen. Uh, so I, I hope that's a, a start to really a very searching question. And Nancy, it's great to see you here. We have one other question, probably the last one that we can get into this session um, from Sarah. How would you compare the elephant imagery for religious understanding versus the journey up the mountain in all of our human understanding of religious tractions and our search? Um, I think the mountain climbing image has a risk that namely, one could say, we're all up to basically the same thing, right? We're all climbing, we're all arriving at the same apex. So why should I be interested in what you're doing on the other side of the mountain? I mean, I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing. Uh, it doesn't quite work for me. Uh, don't our paths intersect even as we climb the mountain? And isn't, and this is not my idea, this is Raimondo Panikkar's idea. Isn't it the case that the mountain is made up of the paths and the paths part of the mountain, right? If, doesn't it matter uh, that not, you know, so if, if you work with the mountain image and say, well, you know, the mountain is actually contains a multiplicity, not any face of that mountain is the same as any other face, then the mountain image begins to look a little bit like the elephant image. And I think that's the way we can sort of make the mountain image come into, into a richer frame. And as I said, that's what Raimondo Panikkar said. Now, if I might just take a moment to say something about John Webster's uh, searching observations. In the book, I take a lot of time to make sure that we don't idealize Gandhi. We've learned too much from Dalit theology uh, and Ambedkar in particular to sort of you know, glorify a, a figure who was problematic for a host of reasons. But nonetheless, I think he remains one of, if not the most powerful post-colonial thinkers that we have. His critique of Western modernity and its totalizing imperial claims together with his critique of uh, capitalism and his foresighted anticipation of the ecological crisis, all of these things, things make him a precious figure from whom we still have only begun to learn. But that learning can include a sharp critique when and as necessary. He was much too late in his life before he finally came around to dismissing caste. Uh, and, and that took way too long, but he did eventually not only dismiss untouchability, 
but eventually utterly reject caste as unsustainable. Uh, but because he didn't do that until he had learned a great deal from Ambedkar, and uh, he can be held accountable. And that's just one reason uh, that he can be held accountable. I think one of the great things I have to do as a teacher at Union, and I think this will be of great interest to, to all of you, is to teach how we can learn from fallible people. Now, you know why that matters? Because that's the only kind of people we got. <laughs> and there is something about uh, the prophetic temperament at Union that sometimes leads Union students, I, I don't wanna generalize, um, they're actually fairly, very mature, but there, there is a propensity among some to say, dude made this mistake. We have nothing to learn from him anymore or her, right? So the, the, the impulse to cast into the dustbin of history, uh, people who have made grave errors, well, where would we be? Uh, where would any of us be? So how, I think one of the things I have to model is how to learn this uh, from, from admittedly fallible and problematic figures. Uh, and I think that's, that's an urgent task for, for union students and for the union community. That's, that's very timely right now. So Dr. Tatamano, thank you so much. Um, thank you all to everyone who came to today's session. And I wanna make sure that everyone's able to go to the next one. Um, we put into the chat, um, just the survey, um, just so we can hear your feedback about this is the first time and maybe hopefully the last time we have to do a virtual um, only uh, reunion, but we would love to hear your feedback about that. And so please feel free to um, fill that out. And um, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Domino, for your amazing talk. Okay. All right. Take care. Take care.